Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence once again, just in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that your word is so precious to us, so dear to us, thankful for the privilege you've given us to study together, to feast upon it. I come into your presence by means of, and only by the means of, our Lord Jesus Christ, asking you to filter out all of that which is not true, but just seal to our hearts that which is, and it's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Hi, this is Steve again at blessedhopeforever.com, uh, 1 Thessalonians part 3, beginning uh, in the second chapter. We've been studying together in this first epistle to the Thessalonians, verse by verse. And in our last study, we had reached the second chapter. Of course, there are no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts. And so uh, I don't want you to look at verse 1 of chapter 2 as if it's somehow disconnected from the last verse of chapter 1. Paul's been led by the Holy Spirit to pen this epistle. I pointed this out in just about every verse by verse video I've done, teaching video I've done, he's writing these words, or he's dictating those words, but it's God who's the author. And that is extremely important for us to understand as we go through these studies. He's writing exactly what God has ordained that he writes. So this is God's word for us. God is speaking to us, not just Paul, to the Thessalonians is what I want you to take note of here. It's God's word for us, more than Paul's letter to the Thessalonian believers. Not to detract from that, but we don't want to forget that it is God that is speaking to us. We'll have impressed upon us in the 13th verse of this chapter that it is in fact, and, in, and it, it is indeed the word of God, not Paul. In chapter one, Paul introduced us to grace, uh, peace, giving thanks for the Thessalonians, praying constantly for one another, remembering one another without ceasing for their work of faith and labor of love and, and patience of hope and, and in God's sight. That he's, this is what he looks at. Perfectly knowing that they were uh, brethren they were related, united together in Christ in that sense. They were, they were loved, dearly beloved, and they were God's elect. Something that's not too popular in most teaching nowadays. That the gospel came in power and in the Holy Spirit. It didn't come as the word of man, but of God. That they became followers. They became imitators of one another and the Lord. They, there was that like-mindedness having received the word in much affliction you can't preach the gospel uh, without that such a like-mindedness that they were like a stamp struck by a die they were they were copies in in fact of one another patterns models of one another and the word was going forth everywhere and that we can't add anything to what god has said because the word is absolutely uh, uh, sufficient in our lives they had turned from idols to serve the living God. They were being delivered from the wrath to come as they awaited, not something future that they would be, but as they awaited, they were being delivered from God's wrath to come as they waited for His return. And with no chapter divisions in the original manuscripts, we read in verse 1 of chapter 2, For you yourselves, brethren, you know our entrance in unto you that it was not in vain. Now, why was it not in vain? Well, because as verse 13 says, and I hate to jump you ahead all the way to, to verse 13, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. Verse 2, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 
and we go back to the book of Acts in the 16th chapter and we see that they were arrested, they were put in prison even though they were Roman citizens and they didn't use the privileges of being a Roman citizen in their work for Christ. They were bold. They were sent by God. And we were made bold. And that, that is a passive voice made bold in our God to speak unto you the good news. God's good news. Even in spite of much contention. Look at it for, for a moment. It's the Gospel of God here in verse 2. It's the Gospel in verse 4. It's the Gospel of God in verse 8. It's the Gospel of God in verse 9. So we're talking about good news here, folks. It's hard to miss the fact that the context is the Gospel and ministry. Uh, I, what I would say is what we're looking at here is the nature, the function, the characteristics, and the evidence of that good news in our lives. So the context is the Gospel and Paul's ministry and therefore our ministry. There's always an application. Sometimes it's called the good news of Christ. Sometimes it's the good news of the kingdom. Sometimes it's the good news of God. And these are essentially the same and essentially a little bit different. God's good news is His sovereign control and power as it regards our being born again from above as a result of the perfect finished work of Christ. Christ's good news is that He was made sin for us, that He died on the cross, that He was buried, that He rose again on the third day from the dead. The Gospel, as everyone understands that, all according to the Scriptures, which is a little less understood by most Christians today, the Gospel of the Kingdom, the good news of the Kingdom, is that this is not defeat, but victory. The Lord Jesus Christ will return. He'll, he will return. He will reign. So there are nuances of these good news. Very, very precious to us. What is being stressed here, folks, is good news. And it is the good news that the sovereign God has ordained us. He's predestined us. He's chosen us. And when you received God's Word, verse 13, which you did, and received it as the truth, the Word of God, there was, it had an effect in your life. There was a result that followed, which we'll also see written about here. It's God's Word, not Paul's. So they were bold. They were sent by God and made bold by God to bring them the good news of God, even in spite of much contention and much difficulty. So it's always there. It's always there. If God is not sovereign, God's not God. He is sovereign in His majesty and in His power. But man thinks that he's sovereign over the issue. Therefore, there is contention. Nothing will cause more contention than a debate concerning God's election and God's sovereignty. Verse 3, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. He isn't using any deceit, any guile. He's not using any false pretense. And many use guile and deceit in their message. If you don't believe that, all you got to do is turn on some of the modern TV programs that profess to be proclaiming the gospel. They're doing it in guile and deceit to raise money, to become famous, or whatever. 2 Corinthians 4, 2. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful ways we do not practice deceit, nor do we distort the Word of God. On the contrary, by open proclamation of the truth, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God, 2 Corinthians 6, 8. Through glory and dishonor, slander and praise, viewed as impostors, yet genuine. Verse 4. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which tries our hearts. We are speaking because we have been allowed, we've been approved of God, and we've been put in trust with this good news. So, so what we are speaking is not our ideas, not our reasoning, not our, our logic, not our thinking. Paul says, not pleasing men but pleasing God for he's the one who tries our hearts the word try there in the Greek uh, is means to examine it, the word is do, dokamazo 
There's two primary reasons to try to something, to test something. If you think you have gold and you put it to the test to prove that it's gold, you know there's gold there and you're going to prove that there's gold there. That's Dakamadza. If someone says to you, well, it, it's, it's gold and you don't think it is, and you know, well, you don't, you really know that there's no gold there. And so you put it to the test to prove that the guy is wrong, to prove that it, that it isn't. That, that's not this word. So God is testing our hearts to prove that they are true. I want you to think of that. One of the sufferings of hell has got to be coming to the realization that you use, you use guile, deceit, foolishness, in order to further your own ends in the service of Christ. But it is God who's putting Paul and his brethren to the test to prove that they are authentic. I believe that to be what the text is saying. Now, I'm not sure that uh, many people get their minds around that. If everything worked great for Paul, you know, he never had any problems. If he never suffered, you know, if he was never opposed, if he wasn't ever beaten or stoned or anything else, you know, everything just went great. You know, he's in perfect health. He's, he's driving a, you know, a, he's driving a, a new Porsche or he's flying a private jet. And he's having a great time preaching the gospel. Then I, I think educated, learned believers, enlightened believers, I think they'd be suspicious. The reason that we know one's testimony is true is because of their suffering. The reason we know that what Paul says is true is because he made no gain out of it. Not only did he, did he make no gain, he suffered greatly. His health must have been bad. Early in the book of Acts, Paul was looked at as a great speaker, a great orator. Yet he says in Corinthians that his speech was contemptible. He was stoned, left for dead. You know, clearly something must have happened in some of his suffering that his speech became contemptible. He was hard to listen to. Everything seemed to be going wrong in his life and in his ministry. Stoned, beaten with lashes, persecuted, almost drowned, shipwrecked, thrown in prison. Why, if you're preaching the gospel of the sovereign God, would it be necessary to go through such experiences? I don't know whether it ever passed through Paul's mind or not. If you were cast in prison for the testimony of Christ, would you sing hymns at midnight? even though you were in chains, set in such a way where you couldn't even lie down comfortably. Paul was being put to the test and his friends put to the test to prove that the message that they were preaching was real. If everything went perfect, well, then everybody in the world would suspect that this was fake. But Paul suffered. We suffer. If you are honestly proclaiming the truth of God's Word, you will not be popular. The popular evangelistic message today is not biblical. You are not redeemed because you did anything. You weren't a goat that was changed into a sheep by recognizing that you were a sinner and you received Jesus Christ to be your Savior. It is not possible to come up with three or four or five or ten rules on how that you can be born again. None of those things are true. Folks, you're born again by God's will and by God's will only. You've been caused to be born again by God, the sovereign, majestic God of all creation. Not by anything in you. You were born not by your will, nor by the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man. Scripture could not be more clear, but by the will of our sovereign God. Yet modern evangelism puts it back on you and gives you the glory or puts it back on you just to, to then tell you to give God the glory for what you did, which really makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, heaping praises on you, you know, the captain of your faith, the, the determiner of your destiny. And that is an appealing message, but it isn't biblically true. You were God's before the foundation of the world. He chose you. He predestinated you. He called you. He justified you. He glorified you. You had nothing to do with it. Nothing. You weren't redeemed because you believed. You believed because you were redeemed. You were, you were not redeemed because you received. You received because you were redeemed. 
You weren't redeemed because you accepted. You were redeemed because Jesus Christ died in your place. That's not a popular message, but it is God who had put Paul and his brethren to the test to prove that they are true. Paul says, For never at any time did we ever use flattering words. And, and folks, if all of this sounds redundant to you who have followed me along through epistle after epistle, verse by verse studies, through Ephesians and Colossians and Romans, if it all seems redundant, if, you, if you're out sitting out there listening to me now and you're saying, Steve, why do you keep harping on the same thing all the time? I want you to let that sink in for a minute. These are not, it's because these are not my words just as they were not Paul's words, but God's. You are hearing it over and over again because it is woven like a golden thread throughout the pages of this precious book that we hold. We were made, the text says, not to use flattering words. Aorist passive. As you know, you perfectly know, you know that, perfect tense. You absolutely know that because... You know that because you were there, Paul says. Nor a cloak of, of covetousness. God is witness. God is witness. Verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Was there any motive of, of covetousness, of greed or desire of making money or of becoming famous or or becoming powerful. God is the one who witnesses this. Therefore, it's God who is having Paul write this. It says, God is witness, verse 5. What are we reading? It is God who is causing this to be written. God is testifying. God is witnessing to the fact that there was no motive of personal desire in the giving of the gospel of Jesus Christ by Paul and his companions. God Almighty is having Paul write that he didn't do it because he wanted fame and glory and praise, didn't want it from them, didn't want it from anybody else. None of the other churches where he ministered. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. The Greek says, though having heavy authority as Christ's apostles. So not even their authority as apostles, which we all know was great, warranted personal glory and praise. Think about that, folks. Compare that to the glory and the praise that men today seek who have far less authority than Paul had. We, we might have stood on our dignity as Christ's apostles, says Paul, but we didn't do that. To do so would have been burdensome to you. He would be placing a burden on them if he had. The word Christ there is a genitive. So it's Christ's apostles, not those who are preaching Christ, but those who are owned by Christ. They are the ones whom Christ sent. He's been sent by Christ. And what he writes is Christ's Word. God's Word. The words of the Holy Spirit. And they're the same. That's true for all, of, all other Christians. And you hold that Word, folks, in your hand. You can, you can buy it for virtually nothing. You can download... <coughs> I don't know how many free versions from the Internet. Apps. Free apps. It's as common as Kleenex, basically. And yet it's not treated as the Word of the Sovereign God. The Apostles of Christ, those sent by Christ with His Word. You have that privilege. You have that opportunity to study it, to rejoice in it, to realize that your God is sovereign and that He has sent you and me to proclaim the Gospel of Christ. And I believe personally that we are to redeem our time because the days are evil, setting our affection on things above, not on things below, and we are running out of time, quickly running out of time. Verse 7 says, We were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, he says, 
we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. The word gentle there, the, the entire sentence structure implies milk, not meat, bringing himself down to their level. The word souls there, suke in the Greek, that's, that is individual personality, a person's distinct identity. Dear, the word dear there is actually the word loved, beloved. Verse 9, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We, we, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Not be chargeable. The word there means to not put a burden on. The reason, the reason for, of, of this unselfish conduct on the part of Paul was that so that there would be no hindrance to the spread of the gospel, that he, he couldn't be accused of being uh, of coveting, unlike the false shepherds who eat, eat the fat, clothe them with the wool, but feed not the flock. Ezekiel chapter 34. Paul had every right to be supported. He just didn't insist on that right lest the gospel should be hindered or reproached. Verse 7, But we were gentle among you even as a nurse cherishes her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own personalities, our own lives, because you were beloved to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto you, any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Verse 10, ye are witnesses in God also. God is also a witness here. How holy and justly and un unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. What does that remind you of? We preached unto you the gospel of God freely through the ministry of the Word. It was a, a labor-intensive work, prayer, reading, meditation, study. These are wearisome activities. They are fatiguing to preach the Word in season and out of season with all long-suffering and doctrine, a work which requires great dedication, oftentimes made the more heavy through the hatred and the opposition of enemies and the loss of friends. We can labor little in the Word and receive much support. That's, that's most seems to be most common nowadays. One can labor night and day with much support. That's, it's also common today, but more rare. Or we can labor night and day with little support. That's less common, but that's more biblical. And that, I believe, would have been Paul. Or we can labor night and day with no support, which is well near impossible, but you know, I have no doubt that that's sometimes done. You know, in verse 10, the immediate context, folks, is behavior. And God also. God also. I want you to note the order of the words, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable, which is what we are. Colossians, we, we saw this when we went through the epistle to the Colossians. Chapter 1, verse 22, which becomes more clear in verse 12, walking worthy of our calling, but we're not quite there yet. Not in a way as to become worthy, but because we've already been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ, seeing that His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and excellence, 2 Peter chapter 1, one of my favorite verses. One of my favorite verses. Seeing that His divine power has granted unto us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Christ, who called us by His own glory, His own glory and excellence. Holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I believe that 
the arrangement of the words confirms the fact that, that that's what Paul is talking about. Verses, uh, when we look at verses 11 through 12, now it's not as a nurse cherishes her children as we saw before, but now, now it's as a father does his own children. As ye perfectly know, it's a perfect tense, you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged. Three words there. Exhorted, to call near. Comfort, to encourage or console. And, and the word charged is solemnly charged. The word is actually witness. It's from the word martyr. It has the same root as the word martyr. Every one of you as a father doth his children that you would walk worthy of God who has called you unto His kingdom and glory. Worthy. Quite simply put, the legalist will read that and say, well, we've got to walk in a way, as, some way as to where we, God will see us as worthy. That's, that's law. Grace interprets that verse just as it, it is written in His Word. To walk worthy is to walk as who we are. Folks, did you know that you are a saint in Christ Jesus? You've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, not according to anything that you've done, but you stand before God, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. We are to walk worthy as who we are, not walk worthy in, in such a way as to try to become something that, we're, that we think we're not. So I think in uh, verses 1 through 12, we see the nature, the function, the characteristics, and the evidence of true ministry, which is, excites me. I'm extremely encouraged by this passage. Right now, everything seems to be wrong. take a look around and at, at every turn it, it just everything seems upside down backwards up wrong inside out there's coming a time where everything will be turned up right I want you to imagine all things being right but then imagine looking back folks and knowing that you spent your final days trying to fix what was wrong to repair what was broken and beyond repair. Folks, that's not our purpose here. I pointed out in the past that you never will ever in Scripture see any place where, God, where Jesus Christ, God Almighty in the flesh, advocated for the overthrow of Nero. You'll never see that with His disciples. They weren't, they weren't ministers of social change. Oh, but Steve, you know, it's, you know, we got to do something. You know, and we pray for the Lord to come. Oh, come Lord Jesus. Come Lord Jesus. And we've been praying that heavily since 20, well, at least 20, since the Revelation 12 sign, if not long before. Some of you out there have been praying that your whole lives. Some of you are in such difficulty and suffering such hardship that, that you're just ready for the Lord to come. And yet we're all guilty of this. You know, we'll pray for Him to come and yet then we'll look around us and we'll see all, all of this stuff that's wrong. We want to try to fix it. Forgetting that everything is in God's hands, that He's paving the way, that these things have to happen in order for Him to return. And folks, to me, it just does not make any sense for us to have our affections set on things below we are to set our affection on things above, not on things below. For our life is hid with Christ in God. So when God's placed you where you are to fulfill His plans and purposes, when you're, when you're not there for self-serving purposes, when you stand alone in solitude and in prayer, seeking direction, when you see that you're one of the, 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 the few voices of reason in a chaotic, confused world, your affection 
set on things above, not below. When your time is limited and you know that time is running out, your time is limited to affect positive spiritual change. I want you to know that your only source of truth and comfort is God's Word. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all of your encouragement, all of your message of, of comfort and support for this ministry. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.